in several of the discourses of the Buddha, he declares that his teaching is concerned with two conditions only, that of suffering and that of liberation from suffering. And this statement is uh, summarized by means of four noble truths, which is the most, uh, which is the, the most essential mnemonic formula of the whole pa Pali Canon. Uh, it summarizes his whole teaching. When you know the Four Noble Truths, you can really make an exposition of the whole teaching. And in the shortest version, the Four Noble Truths go like this. The first Noble Truth, the existence of suffering, Dukkha. The second Noble Truth, the cause of Dukkha. The third Noble Truth, the elimination of Dukkha. And the fourth Noble Truth, the way to the elimination of Dukkha. This formula is actually an old Ayurvedic diagnostic model. And our, the Ayurvedic medicine is approximately 800 years older than Buddhism. And this uh, temp template was well known in the days of the Buddha among uh, at least educated people. Uh, so it was, it was actually very clever to reformulate the whole of the Buddhist teaching within a well-known template. You have to bear in mind that the Buddhist teaching was handed down orally for about 500 years before it was actually written down. So the whole of the canon is uh, structured by mnemonic devices, one of, one of which is uh, the repetition, the methodic repetition, which uh, renders a fantastic cons consistency to, uh, to the exposition of the teaching, uh, but also makes it a little tedious sometimes to read, because uh, the, the the Buddhist discourses are actually meant to be chanted. They're, they're not written books in an ordinary sense. Another aspect is actually that which is completely void of concepts and words, but uh, points to an intuitive understanding which is developed in meditation. That is the true essence of the teaching, the teaching that is based on experiential knowledge of direct seeing into uh, the realities of phenomena. But the, from the point of view of uh, meditation, all the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are co-arising, or they can be understood as co-arising in one moment of consciousness. And that goes for the understanding of all Four Noble Truths as well. There's both this gradual approach and there's this, this all-encompassing approach. So let's have a look at the, at the Four Noble Truths. <coughs> First of all, who is this medicine for? Who is this medicine for? The Buddha is also called a physician a great physician who cures the disease of, of, of existence. So who is the patient? The patient is someone who is designated as a Puchutjana. And it, it's a very it's a little misunderstood uh, concept. It is usually translated as an, a common average person. But it means more than that. Sometimes it's translated as a worldling. But actually, etymologically, it points to a person who has separated himself from reality, who has created an individuality through distortion of perception and consciousness and the way he thinks. Puchutyana. 
So a little clumsy transcription is uh, hallucinatorily <coughs> separated individual. And he's separated from the stream of existence. So let's have a closer look at the state of his suffering and the cause of his suffering. Dukkha means etymologically bad hollowness, bad hollowness. And it points to this lack of a permanent essence and phenomena, especially in our mind, that permanent essence we like to th- we like to think is there, and if it were there, would be our self, our true identity, our true, unchanging, and completely autonomous identity. And actually, the Putujana is so involved in this idea, and is a cause to a great deal of suffering for him. There are three uh, modes of dukkha. There is the dukkha of chains, the potential suffering. I prefer to, trans, trans, to transcribe a dukkha as potential suffering. <coughs> Sometimes it is actualized into what we understand ordinarily as suffering, but all phenomena are characterized by the potentiality of, of the suffering. Uh, so there is potential suffering of chains, and uh, of course the cause understanding of this, the suffering of chains is, as uh, the German poet Rilke says, the great death goes through all things. It's very difficult to to live this life in time without losing something, losing youth, losing health, losing relationships, maybe sometimes losing money and so on, losing opportunities, losing the opportunity of love, and so on. So then there is the uh, Sankara Dukkata. It's a little difficult uh, term. Sankara, it is, it is that which characterizes all dharmas except Nibbana Dharma, except the unconditioned Dharma. Every, all conditioned Dharmas and it's all, all, all other phenomena are characterized by being compounded. They are Sankharas. There are various translations of this term. Constructions, for instance, uh, activities, Buddha was actually the first constructivist in the history of ideas. You know, constructivism is a is a dominating paradigm within uh, modern science. The idea that uh, f- uh, things, phenomena, lack a permanent essence. We'll be concerned about matter now, as science uh, is. They, they're aggregates. They are put. To- they're constructed. They're put together like this bowl. It's a Nepalese singing bowl, and it consists of seven metals, exactly seven metals. I don't know the exact, the exact uh, content of them. But if you remove one of the metals, it's no longer a singing bowl. It doesn't have this sound anymore. Maybe a bowl, a common bowl, but not a singing bowl. It's, it's these, the construction, the compoundity of these seven metals that, that make up this specific uh, phenomenon. And that is what characterizes a compounded phenomena. If you change one relation, you change the whole thing. You change one relation in a system, you change the whole system. Because there's nothing unchanging in it. Everything depends on everything else. And in the West we know this as far as matter is concerned. We have a fantastic understanding of the of the constructed nature of matter. We're not so aware in our culture of that the same state of 
things may I may apply to our psyche, to our mental life. There's a growing awareness about constructivism within modern psychology, like modern psychology is to a large extent uh, influenced by uh, the philosophy of constructivism. What is so potential painful in what is constructed is, of course, that everything depends on everything else. If you apply this to yourself, for instance, to your mind, we like to believe that we are the master on our own house and that we have a self and the working definition of a self is that it must be something that exercises sovereignty over itself it must be autonomous if it depends on something else it's not autonomous the psychic can be happy, but it depends on conditions. But in the psyche there's no such thing as a permanent core of happiness. But the psyche can be happy, but it depends. Just as well as the psyche can be sad, it also depends. The psyche can be anything, it depends on conditions. And a lot of people, they, they, they actualize the pain of, uh, of this state, you know, people with serious problems, they don't want to have, you know, who wants to have serious problems? And if we, 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 we exercise 100% sovereignty over ourselves, ourselves, we would not have serious problems, we would not have depressions and clinical anxieties and so on. But because the mind is a constructed phenomenon, sometimes the constructivities of mental states uh, manifest malfunctioning, which we do not exercise control over. We are subjected to. <coughs> And then there is the last kind of uh, dukkha, dukkha, dukkata. It actually means a suffering of suffering. And it's, it's the kind of suffering which we all know, everybody knows. The, the painful, the, the pain in the body when we're sick or the despair of some tension we experience in our problems, the despair of our problems, the, the, our the depressive states, our fears and, <coughs> and, and all that. This pleasure that is, that is uh, depressive and sometimes unbearable. That's, that's dukkha dukkha. But also uh, the pain caused by illness. The, the pain caused by old age. So let's have a look at the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. And in order to understand, to really understand the second old truth, this template actually incorporates an understanding of rebirth. We don't have to be so con concerned with it, and in, you don't have to have any relationship, whatever, to the concept of rebirth or past lives in order to meditate. There were people at the Buddhist time who did not believe in rebirth, and he said, never mind. You know, I mean, you just go ahead and liberate yourself and experience the fruit of liberation in this life. Don't bother about the past or the future. But it was a, a dominant idea in his, in his time. But in order to understand that the second noble truth can cause, can be the cause of physical suffering, you had to understand this, the, the background in, in the, the side of, of, of past lives. Uh, I'll make one more comment on it. The, the, the second noble truth is, is desire, is this desire thirst, tanha. Because it's actually not change itself that is a cause of suffering, actually not. No, it's, it's not, it's trying to hold on to what is changing. It's desiring what is changing 
it's like trying to hold on to the clouds in the sky. And if your whole life is about this, you will suffer a lot. And also you, you, will, you will be terribly involved in the hopeless business of, of clinging to pleasure and pushing this pleasure away. If you start pl this business of clinging to pleasure, you have to push, you have to feel aversion towards this pleasure in order, in order in, according to, to the logic of, of, uh, of this striving. And this is what the Putujana is doing. He's, that is how he is hal hallucinatorily separating himself from a stream of, of consciousness, vinyana sota, or for the <coughs> stream of phenomena, the dharma sota. He doesn't see the stream. The, the, the stream that the fully liberated becomes as his natural state of mind, a stream purified from all clinging, from all desire, there's no longer desire there, there's only the stream of phenomena, the pure stream. But the Pachutina will have none of that, you know, he, he tries to s construct his separated individuality outside of this stream, you know, he, and, and he sort of, he sort of builds this kind of ivory tower in his, by way of his clinging and condemning, you know, his world. What really is the driving force is the thirst for existence and the thirst for non-existence. The thirst for existence is, could also be understood as a thirst for I and the thirst for non-existence is the thirst for not I. You know, I mean, but when you get entangled with the world the way, or create a world the way the Pachutina does, you, you're involved in this dichotomy, you know, cling and condemning, cling and condemning all the time. And it's actually two sides of the same thirst. So it's, it's understandable that if, when the Pachutina does this, it, he experienced a lot of suffering due to change. What is and not so easy to understand unless you, you for a moment consider the perspective of rebirth is that the, the, uh, the physical pain in the body is due to desire as well. It is, of course, only so if you understand that this body we have in this life is a result of the desire of the past in, at the that moment in the previous life, the desire for existence, which was actualized in a body in this existence. Does that make sense? Just as a theory. Yeah. You don't have to subscribe to it in order to practice meditation. The third noble truth about the elimination of uh, the cause of suffering. This is actually what we are working very hard on. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, will recognize the epistemological sequence that Buddha uses time, time and again in his discourses to explain the functioning of insight. Meditation. Well, let me let me throw some more light on the sorry state of the Putujana. <laughs> you know, because he's not he's, he's really not to blame. You know, I mean, he, he's in, he's just subjected to his existence. And when we are not very mindful, we perceive permanence in what is impermanent. You really have to, as you know, you have to slow down, you really have to slow down in order to perceive change. If you don't walk as slowly as I've seen most of you do, you would never have had this insight into how much change there is in just one movement, movement of, of, of your leg. Like there's a whole stream 
of changeability, right? If you move fast, you don't see change. And if your mind wanders, you know, so your, your mind is, is, is reduced all the time, your, your, your level of awareness is reduced all the time, you don't see much, you don't understand much of what is going on on any level. You don't see a Nietzsche, you don't understand Dukkha, you certainly don't understand Anatta. Impermanence, potential, potential suffering or actualized suffering, and no cause in it. No self. Don't, cannot understand that. When you're not so mindful and you're very involved in this business of constructing yourself, you perceive what is a nature, you perceive it as nature, permanence. It's of course a distortion, it's a vipalasa, it's a hallucination, it's a hallucination. Uh, like when you when you uh, swing a light in night, you know, very fast, a torch, very fast, it appears as a permanent circuit, you know, as an immobile circuit. That's an hallucination of perception. And when you're not mindful, you perceive what is potential suffering, and that goes for the pleasure of the states as well, when you don't... Yeah, yeah. You perceive them as, as sukkha, as uh, pleasure, as joy, or as a source to joy. It's just the opposite, the opposite world. You're in the opposite world. And you perceive what is no core self as core self. This is me, this is mine, that's all. That sound, that's me, that's mine. You know, it go, goes under automatic, continually, when you're first involved in this desire thirsting business as the Putujana is. So you understand he, he lives in the that you understand how he has separated himself from the streets? You know? So his mind when he sits down and do Vipassana meditation, all these hallucinations they surface, you know. All these perceptions of of Nietzsche and what he sees then for the first time is actually a Nietzsche. All these perceptions of Sukkha, which he sees for the first time actually is Dukkha. All these perceptions of core self, which he sees in his inside meditation, which is actually no core self, no self. And if he's not so lucky to get around to practicing inside meditation, he's just caught up in this separated, hallucinatorily separated individuality. So is that clear? You understand that? Yeah, I was just confused for the he and she. Yeah, why you said yeah. It's, it's, it's an individual, both. Yeah. It's not that women are exempted from this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so when the, there's a little hope because in the commentary <laughs> literature, that, that it's stated that there are two kinds of Putujanas. There's just a blind Putujana. I mean, he, there's no hope for him. <laughs> but then there's a Kalayana Putujana. It actually means the blessed, a blessed Putujana. And what his blessing is conferred to him from the beginning of his practice. There's also a nicer word for for the blessed, the Kalayana Putujana, and that is a Chula Sotapanna, a little stream in them. Because in his development of insight into the stream, he's just, he's in the right, he's in the right direction, you know, he's about to enter the stream. As I mentioned, the, when we switch over to Vipassana now, we try to enter the stream. And to the extent that you begin to understand rise and fall, you are becoming a little stream in them. And the way you become a little stream in them is that you begin to see a Nietzsche and then you become disillusioned because you're so accustomed, you've customized yourself to 
understand that I am permanent, my identity is all what I think is me, myself, it's not momentary. But all of a sudden you, you begin to see it and then you become disillusioned. So the first factor in this epistemological sequence which characterizes insight is nibida disillusioning. It is translated in various ways sometimes, you become disenchanted. And the disillusionment, that, that's like a wakening up, You're just, just in the transition, it's a little painful, you know, or whatever you thought was like this and, or that, you see, it was, it's actually not like this or that. That is a little painful to discover this, but then, then it's the, the serenity of understanding reality as it is uh, takes over. So there's Nibida, then there's Viraka. Viraka uh, means the fading, or is translated as the fading of, away of passion or fading away of desire. Uh, and and uh, the, a modern, very eloquent transcription is letting go. Letting go. What you let go of is your unwholesome reactivity. You let go because you become disillusioned. You let go of your cling and condemning because you see in the momentariness of your object there's nothing there to cling to, there's nothing to condemn. So nibida disillusioning leads to letting go and then you're in a state of vimutti, you're liberated for one moment. As far as your relation to this object is concerned, you're li liberated. Nibida viraka vimutti. So this liberating process goes on continually in inside meditation. To the extent we have the insight into momentariness, to the extent we have the insight, a little more advanced insight into the poten potential suffering in what is momentary and impermanent. And to the extent that we have the still more mature insight into uh, no core self in what it, we perceive as momentary and potential suffering. There is Nibida, disillusioning, a deepening of disillusioning, a deepening of let it go, and an expanding of liberation. And we have these insights in the context of our uh, biography, in the context of the story we have about ourselves. <clears throat> The Puchutjana he has developed a fantastic story about himself up to the point where he starts meditating. <laughs> in, in Western psychology, it's called the, the self-narrative. And we all have such a narrative. We're telling it to each other continually, you know. So then I was there, and then this and that happened to me, and then I said so and so, and so on. And the, the, the narrative, the story changes a little bit every time we tell it, right? <laughs> Even the Buddha has such a story about himself. And of course it's... the content of that is, reflects his liberation, reflects his understanding of the nature of existence, whereas the Pututjana story is very incoherent, you know, there's a lot, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of big lacoons in it, you know, which has been suppressed and so on, things he did not want to look at, you know, and so there are these big holes in his stories, and it's a little, it's a really a mess when he begins to tell it, you know. And he develops his insight into Anicca Dukkha and that, and the context of this story as he surfaces. The, the insights are really on two levels. They are the, the existent, on the existential level, anicca, dukkha, anatta, and then there is on the biographical, psychological level, you know. This whole story I have about myself, my childhood, my upbringing, my travels, I went there and I met this person and I said this and that person said, said that to me. This whole story, in the context of that, I, we develop the existential insights. And both levels of insight are tremendously enriching, tremendously fascinating. And on the outset, a little painful to, to work with. 
something. You're not convinced that, that you are separate, you are hallucinatorily separate from the stream of consciousness, from the stream of phenomena. And maybe if we don't understand this before, we are, we are enlightened. Because there's no one there to understand it. You know, that's... <laughs> that's the recurring problem, you know. So the third noble truth, that's the prognosis. You know, the prognosis is good, the patient can be cured. Do insight, let go, become liberated, moment by moment. Sort of accumulate the, the karma. The karma of insight it's, it's a very powerful so-called repetition karma. And the repetition karma is that that action, that activity we do most in our life. It becomes a very very powerful. It accumulates as a very very power, powerful force. And and actually the the karma is a special karma. It's a special kind of repetition karma. Uh, because the, the karma inside is actually another formally, on a one level it's holds, of course wholesome karma, but it's a special karma in so far, it's not a black karma or white karma. It's not a white nor black karma, it's that karma which, uh, which uh, surmounts all karma. It's that karma which has the power to decondition our mind from the results of all karma. Yeah, the prognosis is good, the patient can be cured. He can enter the stream of the real world and live in peace, in harmony with the realities of life, with the realities of his mind. If he takes the right medicine, and that's a noble eightfold path. The, the characteristic of, of this uh, mnemonic system is that the, the various links are each a mnemonic uh, threat. Like to begin at the end of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path in itself is a threat, a sutta. <coughs> so when you memorize this threat, you, you have, and, and you can, you can, uh, you can make an exposition of each of the links. You, you, you know quite a lot of the Buddhist teaching. An exposition of the eighth, uh, no, of the eighth uh, step of the Noble Eightfold Path, that is uh, right concentration, Sama Samadhi. That is uh, formally, it is, the, it is the eight jhanas, you know, which are the traditional uh, uh, way of describing concentration as an, uh, yeah. But, but really, whatever, whatever concentration co-arises with the other seven uh, factors, that is right concentration, says the Buddha. Whatever concentration arises with the other factors, whatever concentration arises with the right speech, that is right concentration. The seventh link, the seventh step, uh, refers to the four foundations of mindfulness. It's a huge exposition that will clarify what these foundations are about. Joseph has written a whole book about it, which is over there in the in the lounge, and uh, it goes it goes for samasadi as well that. Samasati, that is actually whatever mindfulness arises, co-arises with the other path factors. That is right mindfulness. I won't go through all the, uh, all the path links. Um, just, po just point out that uh, you can understand the Noble Eightfold Path as a, as a process, as a linear process, you know, you start out with, with, uh, with, uh, with right view, as the Pututya does, he hears about the Buddhist teaching, he acquires a theoretical <coughs> right view, and then you go on to, you're stirring up right thought, right intention, and so on, 
From the point of view of the meditation, meditation psychology, all these factors are co-arising in one state of mind. The Sheila factor is then like the supportive condition of that concentrated awareness. And if it was not there, it would, would be difficult to concentrate. The, the relationship between the three sections of the Noble Eightfold Path is that, that uh, Sheila leads to gladness in the sense of non-remorse. I did the right things. I don't have to worry about what I did, that it was wrong, I did the right things. So it's easy for me to concentrate my mind. And uh, as I concentrate my mind, it becomes easy for me to understand what I'm focusing on. And I begin to see, I begin to have these insights. Actually, what, what, I, what I used to recommend, whoever listens to my exposition of this one, the truth is that please forget the whole thing, because you, 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 you understand, you have to develop your own understanding, you know. The, the, the only way to understand for no truth is it by experience in your insight, you know. Actually, to put to invest too much faith in in your teacher can be a hindrance, as I pointed out this morning, can be a hindrance to your to your motivation to test all these theories for yourself, see for yourself. So you should be a little skeptical about everything what I've said, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe something about it, but uh, maybe not. Uh, I, I have to test these things out for myself. So that's the end of my talk. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. So there's a teaching uh, from the Buddha which is called clear comprehension and that's an aspect of mindfulness which has to do with understanding the context of what we're doing and it's understanding the purpose of what we're doing. So we could be undertaking the metta practice for example with the purpose of perhaps easing a difficult relationship. So we're understanding that's our intention in a particular time for doing the metta. And that's fine. That intention or that purpose uh, is skillful. That's different than as we're doing the phrases, leaning into them, is the relationship getting better? I hope it's getting better. If I do this more, will it get even better? <coughs> In other words, we set the intention, the purpose, and then let it go. And then we simply do the practice and let the practice unfold. So we set the intention or the purpose at the beginning and then let it go. And then we bring the mirror-like awareness of mindfulness to whatever is present. And I think the image of a mirror can be a helpful one in understanding the nature of mindfulness. That is, mindfulness, like a mirror, simply reflects or simply knows what's arising. So if, we do, if we're aware of pain in the body, the mirror is reflecting the pain. It's not, it doesn't have an agenda with respect to the pain. It's simply knowing, or like the mirror, it simply reflects. So it's just to understand that we can have a purpose, an initial intention for undertaking a particular practice. We set the intention and then let it go and simply do the practice. You know, without that wanting in the mind. So I hope that's somewhat clear to you. Any other questions? Um. 
Uh, the power of words, you know. I'm wondering whether these are synonyms. Being mindful, being aware, being present. Are they all equal hmm. weight? Okay, is being aware, being mindful, being present all the same? <clears throat> this is one of the problems in language because in English at least, each of those words has multiple meanings. And so sometimes it gets confusing, which is why the other night I tried to distinguish how being present is a part of mindfulness it's necessary, but it's not sufficient because the black lab is present, but it's not being mindful. So it's a part of mindfulness. Being aware, aware in English is a very tricky word. It means a lot of, we use it in a lot of different ways. I like how Ufa has been talking about mindfulness, including the awareness that we're aware. I think that's a very useful, because sometimes we say aware simply to mean conscious. Right? We're conscious of something, we're aware of something, we're not unconscious. So that not like being present, it's not necessarily being mindful. It's awareness, as we've said, being aware that we're aware really captures the, the quality of mindfulness. I have some <clears throat> difficulty distinguishing uh, the, the thought process. When we meditate and the uh, thought arises and we try to let it go, that's one thing. But if we, in the person, are trying to investigate something that arises, is that not also a kind of a thought process? And how, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was <clears throat> trying to understand the thought process in the meditation and as thoughts come and go, we're simply trying to be aware of them and letting them go. But then when we talk about investigation of various things, isn't that another kind of thought? <clears throat> investigation in Vipassana does not particularly mean or doesn't happen particularly through the thought process, as it often does when we use it perhaps in Western scientific, you know, we're investigating something and we're thinking about it. In Vipassana practice, investigation is another word for the wisdom factor. And it really means, it has a broad meaning, but very specifically, the investigation means seeing the arising and passing of phenomena. So that doesn't require thought. That just takes a careful observation. So that's the kind of investigation that's meant. Um, yeah. Often been told in instructions uh, to rest in pure awareness. So, how many awarenesses are important to <laughs> That's really just another... Uh, well, first, different, different Buddhist traditions use different terminology. And so, if you study or, you know, are learning in different, in different schools, they may use the terms differently. Uh, for the purpose of Vipassana, you could say pure awareness is being mindful. As I said, in other traditions, they may be using it somewhat differently. Somebody here had a question. How, how to be we between this? Because I am very bad in this. Yeah. It's like my breathing. Who is there? So the question was about the condition of tinnitus. You may be aware, you know, where this one hears the ringing in the ear sometimes louder, sometimes softer. Uh, it's not uncommon. I mean, uh, basically, I would just uh, be an, in an easy, accepting rhythm of sometimes when it's very predominant, that becomes the object, and at other times, if it can be in the background, 
then you're attending to the breath or sensations or other things, but not to get in a struggle with it. So, so it can just be, it's just something that's there. And sometimes it's in the foreground, sometimes in the background. You know, and just go with that rhythm and then it's not a problem. Because you can be aware, even though the sound may be there all the time, just like with the sound of the bell, if when you are attending to it carefully, you'll see that it, you know, there's a vibratory quality to it. So you can be seeing the impermanence of phenomena in that. So it's, it can be another object. Um, but you want to uh, yeah, let, it, let it be in the foreground and then at other times be in the background as it is. A what? Uh, the perfect retreat, I really uh, wanted it to be. Uh, and, and then you started to talk about the death. The problem is that emotions, just like certain physical sensations, certain emotions are unpleasant. You know, just like pain in the body is an unpleasant feeling. Certain emotions are unpleasant, and we've been conditioned to avoid them. Oh, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel the fear. I don't want to feel the anxiety. Well, in meditation, in Vipassana, what we do is precisely to open up in the same way that we might open to a pain in the body. Okay, it's okay. Let me feel it. (coughs) This emotion is okay. The fear is okay. The anxiety is okay. And as you learn how to relax into the experience of that emotion, it's okay, let me feel it. Then you begin to see the impermanent nature of that emotion. Yeah, fear is there, and we feel it, and we're with it, and then it passes away. And the anxiety is there, we feel it, and it passes away. So we're not so resistant then to these emotions, and when we're more allowing of them, we don't have to live so defensively. <laughs> now, if we're afraid of feeling certain emotions, then we create our lives you know, to, to set up the barrier so we never have to feel them. But that's, that's a very uh, limiting way to live. So it's, it's actually all good what you are experiencing. And you want to practice being mindful, being allowing for those feelings to come up, to be with them and to let them pass.